begins with, we'll go slowly the first time and then go through it again. So creation, that's Genesis 1 and 2, the seven days of creation. Fall, that has to do with Genesis 3, the sin uh, entered into the world. Flood, that's Noah, chapter 6 through 9. Uh, God judged the world because of sin. And as your fingers are kind of spread with the rain, hopefully that reminds you of the crown of the various nations that began, um, basically Genesis chapter 11. So it's creation, fall, flood, nations. Then uh, the period of time from Adam and Eve until Christ is 4,000 years. And as your hands are stretched out, we're going to go to the birthplace of Abraham, which was Ur. So point over there to Ur. And what's the body of water? Persian, Persian Gulf. Gulf. And it has salt. That reminds us of the four people that left Ur and went up to Haran. So S, Sarah, Abraham, Lot, and Terah. Now we're going to finish our map. And so Terah reminds us, it starts with a T, and so the one river that comes from the Persian Gulf and goes kind of northeast <coughs> is Tigris. Tigris, and then one that kind of goes north, northwest, Euphrates, Euphrates and the city that uh, Sarah, Abraham, Lot, and Terah moved to from Ur was Haran. Haran. Is it Haran? Mm -hmm. I looked well, it up because okay. sometimes well, I, I say I, Haran. I, is there a proper? I don't know. Is there I, a dictionary for this? The internet. I punched <laughs> it and it said Haran. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. So Haran. What happened in Haran? Somebody died. Tara, the father, died. Now finish our map. So we've got the Sea of Galilee. Barb, it's over the Sea of Galilee. It's right in the middle of that uh, table. Sea of Galilee, then the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and what's this country? Israel. Israel reminds us of the two sons of Abraham. The first one was... Ish is a male, Ishmael, and his second son, Isaac. Now, Isaac is going to have two sons that we're going to cover today. His one son was very hairy, and so if, as a man, uh, think of uh, feeling the hair on the man's arm, so Esau. The other son was a little bit uh, a mother's boy, evidently, and so <coughs> didn't have that uh, rough uh, hunter kind of personality. So it's Esau and Jacob. So Esau, you will feel the hair, and Jacob kind of a, <laughs> a lady's soft hand kind of thing. So let's try it. Creation, fall, Blood, nations, 4,000 years, Ur, Persian Gulf, Salt, Sarah, Abraham, Lot, Terah, Tigris, Euphrates, Haran, Terah dies. Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Israel. What's next? Ishmael, Isaac. Now this is kind of a circle. We're, we're pointing to Israel. We're going to go Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob. Ishmael, Isaac, Esau. So it's kind of a circle. The issue with this survey is remembering the transitions. When some, you'll get stuck, what comes after, um, uh, see, you know, one thing and what happens next. Once you get into that routine, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Mediterranean Sea, uh, Israel. So that connect, those connections are what are hard. And once you get that next connection, so kind of a circle. Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. The two sons of Ishmael. Now of Isaac.
for Esau and Jacob. Okay. We're going to have the whole Old Testament. Uh, uh, OT1 will only be half Old of man. the historical movement of the Old Testament. It Old goes up to Joshua. OT2 goes from Joshua up to Jesus. So that's the entire Old Testament, but not this class. Is OT2 going to follow this class directly? I haven't decided yet. Uh, I've been uh, switching between a theological uh, class, like either hermeneutics or Christology, oh, yeah, or yeah. I've been kind of going between a survey and a more theology kind of class. So whether I'll continue that or I, I'll talk with Chris and it depends. Okay, Genesis in one word, what's the one word summary of the topic of Genesis? Beginnings. It's the beginning of the world, of the universe, the beginning of man, the beginning of the chosen nation. Uh, Abraham, the covenant is beginning. Uh, beginnings. Uh, we divided it into kind of two parts. Uh, the origin of all of the nations of the world. And we looked at creation, fall, flood, and uh, tower of Babel. And then the second part was the idea of an election of a chosen nation, which we looked at four people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So we're on <coughs> Abraham, and we just talked last week about Isaac. Uh, Isaac was born. What I want to do, I'm going to have you guys read the verses for me. And I want to just go in order so we don't have to wait for somebody to read so that you know that you're going to be the next one to read the verses. And we'll just kind of go around the circle and then we'll hit the two ladies in the back after Paul and then come back again to Mark and things over here. So, okay. You got it. Uh, so, last week we talked about Isaac. He was born... Um, Let's look at chapter 21, Genesis 21, verses 1 to 5. And Mark, if you would read that for us, please. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Good. Did you notice the emphasis that it came from Sarah? Sarah, uh, it, it said in verse 1, For the Lord did to Sarah, as he had promised, verse 2, Sarah, uh, con conceived and then Sarah whom Sarah verse 3 bore to him uh, it's the idea that this one came from Abraham and Sarah and it's also the if you want to often look for emphasis look for re repetition kind of thing it was just as God had promised God just as he had spoken uh, just as God had commanded him uh, it's the idea that God fulfilled his promise. And they named him Isaac. Remember what we said the word Isaac means? Laughter. Laughter. Often in scripture, the name uh, it parallels the character, <coughs> the events, the life of the person. And we see that here. The first laughter is when... Sarah was told at 89 years of age that she was going to have a baby. And it says she laughed to herself. And I believe it was the pre-incarnate Christ asked, why did she laugh? And so now her son is called, he laughs. And so it'd be a reminder uh, of her lack of faith. But I think more so it would be a reminder of the blessing of God that at the age of 90, she had a child. And so every time she would call laughter, laughter, the joy 
of having a son that came through her. However, not all was well. Ishmael began to mock Isaac. Chapter 21, verse 9, please. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which he had born of Abraham, mocking. Okay. Do it, some of you have a different translation besides mocking? Scoffing. Scoffing. Laughing. Uh, some will say laughing. It's actually the same root word as the name Isaac, but it has an intensifier on it. And so if I can try to illustrate it, it's the difference between ha oh, and ha ha. Can you feel the difference? It's, it's a mocking kind of a laughter. And that's why we translate it as uh, a mocking. And thus they decide, uh, Abraham decides to send uh, Hagar and Ishmael away. But God promises that a nation, a great nation, will come from Ishmael. Kathy, 21, verse 13. Yet I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman, because he is your seed. Okay. God is going to bless Ishmael. It's interesting. Who uh, bought Joseph? The Ishmaelites. The descendants of Ishmael are going to be the ones that take Joseph down to Egypt uh, a little later tonight, hopefully. Oh, the offering of Isaac, uh, chapter 22. God gives Abraham a command that I'm glad that he's not given to me. I don't think my faith would be up to what uh, God asked Abraham to do. He commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. Chapter 22 and verse 2, please. He said, take thou your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Now, Abraham, not like Charles, my mother would always call me <coughs> Charles when I'm not completely obedient. And, um, I want you to see his faith as we look at some of these next verses. Uh, Abraham quickly obeyed. I'm going to uh, read verse 3, 9, and 10. So it's chapter 22, verse 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cleaved the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. So when did he go? Next right away. The next morning and it, it even... Uh, it's it's amazing to me uh, said that he rose early in the morning so right away uh, that he went and then verse also 9 and 10 and they came to the place which God had told him of and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood so the test seems to be to see if Abraham is willing to obey God in faith, knowing that God had promised through Isaac, through this son, that the blessing would pass. So he has that promise directly from God. And is he going to trust God with it? That, um, I want you to go back, um, go back to verse 5, 22 and verse 5, and I want you to see Abraham's faith. 22 verse 5, please. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Where do you see his faith in that verse? Mine says, We will worship and return to you. This including Isaac mm -hmm. So what's that mean? Die or I mean, 
brought back to life again or something. Yeah. So, somehow the two of them mm -hmm. are going to return. Yet Abraham, knowing that he's going to sacrifice his son, and yet somehow trusting that God is going to fulfill the promise that he made through this son, through Isaac, that we will return. So Abraham had faith. Um, he knew that God had promised, and thus he uh, was willing to obey even when he didn't fully understand, didn't fully know how, didn't fully know why, how, and yet he obeyed. Uh, so God is going to intervene as he sees Abraham's faith, chapter 22 and verse 12. Paul? Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So he's going to provide a ram uh, in place of Abraham. And thus God is going to repeat the covenant. Towards the end of this chapter we see, or the next part, uh, the covenant the idea that God is going to bless Abraham and his descendants. Uh, verses 15 to 18. Very good. What's the significance in verse 16? By myself I have sworn. Oh. What's the significance of that little phrase? Well, he went through the, the covenant thing with the animals cut in half. It was only God that made the promise, so he was responsible for fulfilling it alone. Hmm. I swear by myself. Well, there's no one higher you can swear by. Okay. <laughs> so we know it's going to happen. See, uh, some would say that the land promise uh, was never fulfilled, remember back in chapter 17, because uh, the descendants disobeyed that this covenant, God was not um, responsible for fulfilling it because of the disobedience of the Israelites. And that's true, they did disobey. But the, the, it seems to emphasize in verse 16 that it's, I myself, it's not going to be dependent upon your obedience or the obedience of your descendants. This is a promise that I am making on my own without any stipulations without any requirements. You don't, you're not have to do A, B, C. This is something I'm going to do. Paul. What does God say that Isaac was his only son? You can ask him when you get there. <laughs> I don't know, Paul. Uh, let's see, so that's the uh, offering of Isaac and the testing of Abraham's faith. Chapter 23, um, the death of Sarah uh, takes place. Read verses 1 and 2, please. Lynn? Sarah was 107 and 20 years old, and there were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Sarah's and the same thing is he brought in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So she lived to be 127 years old. And she died. Next chapter, chapter 24, we see the marriage of Isaac. Uh, Abraham is going to arrange for his uh, servant uh, to go back to Haran and to find a wife uh, for Isaac. And um, let's see, let's read verse 24, verse 3 and 4. 
thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. So the servant goes uh, and he prays as he gets to this uh, oasis, to this well, and he prays, Lord, if there is a girl that comes and I ask her for a drink of water and she gives me the drink of water, but if she also says, let me also get water for your camels, then I'll know that she is the one. And so the servant uh, um, makes that prayer to God. And let's see what happens. Verses 17 through 24. Chapter 24, verse 17 through 24. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water in thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until thou, they have done drinking. She hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, he held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. It came to pass that the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, she bare unto him. So a question. What do you guys think of a fleece? A fleece, if you remember going back to Gideon, uh, he said oh, God came to him and told him what he wanted to do, but Gideon didn't really believe, and so he said, Lord, so that I'll know that you want, I think it was Midianites, that you want me to deliver uh, Israel from the Midianites. I want you to make this uh, skin, this uh, wet in the morning from dew, but everything around it dry. And that happened the next day. He said, I still don't know, Lord. Uh, so make the, the fleece uh, dry and everything around it wet. And God did it to confirm. So what do you think about today? Uh, giving a fleece. Lord, if you want me to marry Maggie Johnson, <laughs> I pray that she would call me in the next five minutes. Ready? What do you think? It's not. It's not what happened. Oh. Oh. I'm just, okay. that's what some who believe in fleeces would, would do, maybe. I just made it up. Sure. What do you think? Yes or no, and why? Jeez. We She's have silenced her tonight. Um, it just was a whole different way of, I mean, people talk to God, I mean, directly. I mean, it's a whole different way of interacting with him than we have now, apparently. So you're saying now that that's not what we should do? Yeah, well, it won't generally work, I don't think. Okay. Well, this, don't yeah, put the Lord your God to the... God. Okay. He gives us the, us the desires as we delight ourselves in him. Um, so there's other ways probably to figure out what God's will is in situations. Okay. Lynn, what were you saying? I thought I was going to say, we have the word of God that is communication to us. Okay. Um. He's not limited to... He wants to do something he can. <laughs> oh, so you're saying that a fleece is okay? If I'm pushing, well, I I'm know. pushing I you. Says you're not to tempt the Lord thy God. Oh, um, but I, He knows our frame. So okay. we have a dust, and so sometimes we need a little encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> a phone ring. <laughs> so is it a fleece? You 
know, when you're struggling with something and you don't feel like you're getting a clear answer, then how do you ask for a clear answer? I mean, um, you know, it's not like Gideon who had the clear message and he put his fleece out there kind of testing God. Or, but when you don't know the answer, but you need one, I'm sorry, I fleece too much, but um, and, and yet I don't because I always doubt, because I wonder, is this right? So then I don't think it really, I don't get too many answers that way. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a struggle. When you're struggling yeah. with something and the answer's not clear, you know, I, I confess, I'll put a police out there, but then I, mm -hmm. I don't have the faith to really follow. So if I hear you, you're saying the answer is not clear, so there's no uh, direct scriptural, like, uh, should I marry this unbeliever? Um, where the scripture would directly give uh, what I should or should not do. So there's no clear uh, scripture uh, one way or the other in this kind of situation. So then uh, what do you think in that situation? have freedom. Mm -hmm. So you have freedom to do a fleece or to, oh, yeah. it's too bad you we uh, lost our voice here. <laughs> Why don't we bring back casting lots and the umum and the thummum or whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, that worked back then. Yeah. Why they would, it's scriptural. <laughs> it, it was back then. That's true. <laughs> Kevin, you had a I saw you wiggle. Kind of, um, God knows our hearts, so if, if we're really struggling to find the answer, and, and Lord, what, you know, do you really want me to do this? And can you show me that? And I know a young man pretty good that did that, and he was shown like right away. But, so it was kind of. I believe that it gave him that peace and that decision at that moment yeah. to okay, take the next step and keep following me because I got gotcha. you. That's yeah. Uh, people land on both sides yeah. uh, of the issue. I I uh, disagree with it when it contradicts scripture, and yet I often hear people putting out a fleece. Um, which and often is young people and they're, they know that God wants them to marry this unbeliever, you know, kind of thing, and they have put out a fleece, supposedly, and God has, you know, given them. Um, so I, I very much agree we have the scripture. Uh, also in Second Peter 1.3, it talks about that his divine power has given to us all that we need for life, and for godliness. Um, and so the Holy Spirit now lives within us. Also, we have the promise of God that if we will ask, we will receive. And so uh, with that promise, I think we can, can pray. And then, uh, was it you, Kathy, that was mentioning this? As we delight in the Lord and as our thoughts become and are aligned with God's thoughts and our aspirations aligned with his aspirations, I believe that as we pray, we can confidently choose and know that that is where God is guiding. With, for me, I always go, it's, I, I like what Blackaby said, that it's easier to know God's will when someone is moving than it is when someone uh, refuses to move and, and wait. And so as I've prayed, as I've sought counsel from others, as I've searched the word of God, uh, I believe that God's desires are part of my heart and that I can choose my desire uh, with that confidence that I've, I've submitted to him and sought his will and direction and, and feel that that's where he's, feel that that's where he's leading. What I always told my students in college they were always, you know, marriage is, you know, so I always go, okay, 
If you want to know if you should marry this girl or not, and you're going to use a fleece, then use one like what Gideon did and say to make the fleece being, if I go outside and my car is floating uh, six foot off the ground, then I'll know that this is what you want me to do. You know, the, the fleece that Gideon gave was what I would call a class A miracle. It wasn't a circumstance of five, next five minutes, if Maggie calls, I'll know I should marry her. It was uh, what I call a class A, not a class B miracle. But, uh, so anyway, uh, I'm, uh, if it aligns with the word, it's not in contradiction to the word of God, if you've sought counsel, if you've prayed, um, I'm not completely against a fleece, but I don't recommend using a fleece. But uh, again, God is able to use a fleece. I'm, I'm, my concern is that I think Satan also can uh, manipulate uh, things uh, so. yeah. okay <clears throat> yeah. uh, thus uh, Rebecca uh, goes back and becomes the wife of Isaac verse 63 to 67 chapter 24 verse 63 and Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening and he lifted his eyes and looked and there the camels were coming <laughs> No, 63 through 67, the end of the chapter. Can't stop there. We're just <laughs> seeing our bride to be. Then Rebecca lifted her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, as um, before she had said to her, to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, It is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So that would be an amazing, uh, I'm not a girl, and don't know all the feelings that go through a girl's mind, but this young gal, um, uh, it would have been amazing feelings that would have been going through. It's interesting talking to uh, people in the Middle East and different groups that do alignment. I've talked with Chinese that the parents will choose the, the spouse kind of thing. And, um, and, and to me, I guess God is able to work through our method, I think. Uh, and he's able to work through that method as well. But it'd be amazing feelings that Rebecca would have, would have had. That'd be a lot easier, you know. <laughs> I don't know, as a father, <laughs> it, uh, I did nice. appreciate uh, a young man who before he contacted my daughter had contacted me and we had corresponded uh, and things several times and uh, I very much appreciated that uh, and and for me I still I was uh, 34 when I got married and uh, I went to Maggie's father to ask for her hand for permission before I asked Maggie and I think that's uh, you know uh, a good way of discerning is God in this is to know where the parents stand uh, in that relationship and that's what I was after is this God's will so rather than having her call five minutes one of the things I wanted was the blessing of her father uh, and things so uh, so chapter 25 Abraham dies verses 7 and 8 the death of Abraham who's next these are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life. And he was gathered to his people. What's it mean he was satisfied with life? What translation is that? I don't know. Uh, in the American Oh, that's. It says full of years in the NIV. Satisfied with life. 
He was an old man, satisfied with life, and he was gathered. Died so it said fullness. Age. I don't see satisfied with life anywhere. Ah. Uh-huh. Well, the inspired version uses satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> says where two of you, have, no, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> um, so anyway, he was content, full of years. Uh, God blessed him uh, and his faith. Chapter 25 goes on to list uh, some of the descendants of, um, of Ishmael. Uh, and the only verse I want to look at is 18 to see that uh, there was hostility even at this early stage uh, amongst these various descendants of Ishmael and Isaac. Chapter or chapter 25, verse 18. And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria, and he died in the presence of all his brethren. <coughs> he died in the presence of all his brothers. That one, he died. Can you read that last part again? Yep. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. Ooh. Uh, what? That's quite different from mine. Boy, I guess um, so. I didn't look that up. I wasn't aware of a variance there. Mine says he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Just a hint yeah. of the conflict um, that we see yet today uh, between these various descendants. Uh, so that's Isaac. That was Abraham. Uh, we want to now transition basically and look at Isaac and Rebecca. Um, and so if you remember, Isaac is going to have two children. And who are they? Esau and Jacob. And so we see the birth of Esau and Jacob in chapter 25. Uh, It's interesting that Isaac and Rebekah are also barren. Uh, They were not initially able to have children. I think it was 20 years uh, after they were married before they were able to have children. Uh, can we read 25, verse 20, and verse 26? And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Hadamon, the sister of Laban. I asked you to read that one because you did very well, thank you. <laughs> but how, the point was, how old was he when he was married? 40. 40, okay, then verse, um, what was it? 26, Danielle. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore him. So 60 years old, so 20 years um, of not having children. Uh, now Jacob is the second of the twins that were born. There were two children uh, in her, Esau and Jacob. And when Jacob is born, he... Uh, Oh, wait, let's read it. I think is that, (coughs) was that 26? Anyway, when he was born, he had grabbed hold of the heel of his older brother. So Esau was born first. When Jacob was born, he was holding on to Esau's heel. And thus they named him the one who grabs the heel would be a a direct translation, the one who, it could be when it's in a negative sense, the one who trips, the trickster, something like that, the one who trips someone else. And we're gonna see that in the life of, of Jacob. But not only is he going to be a tricker, he's going to also be the one who is tricked. Uh, and so we'll see that as he as we go along. Um, so the birth of Isaac. Uh, one of the things that's going to happen is that Esau is going to sell his as the oldest son, sell his birthright to the younger son. It's going to show us both 
the sneakiness of Jacob, as well as the, how Esau did not value that, that birthright. So let's read chapter 25, verses 29 to 33. Paul, I think that's you. 25, verse 29 to 33. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Through 33. Edom or Edom, or how do you say it? Anyway, Jacob replied, First, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? Up through where? One more. But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Okay, so this took place. I assume that this was not a private deal that um, Isaac uh, would have uh, heard of it as well as Rebecca. Um, that there's no indication that it was, and so it's only conjecture. But um, I don't necessarily see it as something that would have been secret. Now the Abrahamic covenant is going to be uh, is going to be confirmed uh, with Isaac, uh, and it's going to come through uh, to me a very unusual circumstance. Uh, I usually think of if I obey God, then God, God's going to uh, give me some kind of blessing. There's kind of that feeling in me, though I don't have that promise. Uh, but we're going to see the opposite uh, taking place in this chapter. Uh, there's a parallel situation now between the life of Isaac and the life of Abraham. If you remember, Abraham twice told a lie about his wife, uh, Sarah, and said because he was uh, nervous about losing his life, and so he lied and said, she's my sister. So we're going to see that same lie taking place with Isaac. Uh, chapter 26, verses 6 to 11. And when Isaac woke in Haran, and the man of that of the place asked him his wife, and he said, she's my sister. Uh-huh. For he feared to say, she is my wife, lest I should be the man of the place to kill me, so Rebecca, because she was spared to work upon. It came to pass, and he had been there a long time, as the Moab came into the place and looked out of the window and saw and behold, Isaac was pouring with Rebecca and his wife. And the Moab called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. And how sayest thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. Through 11? Yeah, that's through 11. Why did he, in verse 7, why did he lie? Feared for his life. I want to ask you a question. Um, is, basically, the question is, is it okay to lie in order to save your life? And in order to make it personal, uh, if someone comes up to you, and says, I want to kill your daughter, or I want to kill your son, or your child, or whatever. Uh, is he here in the house? Oh, gosh. <laughs> of course not. Is it okay to lie yeah. in order to save a life? Yeah. Because in a sense, that's what, uh, at least in the feeling, I mean, we can talk about it's a sin to lie, and that's what, kind of what we did with Abraham. <clears throat> But I want us to ponder for a couple minutes on uh, if you were in a situation, whether it was, uh, you know, where you thought your life was at stake or a life. What about the midwives in Moses' time who lied about the Egyptian women giving birth and then they were honored because of it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they were honored for saving the babies. Yeah. Yes. 
One of, the, one of the principles in hermeneutics is not everything that happens in Scripture is right. It happened. Uh, we know that it happened. We can know that. But whether it was moral or right in what they did. And also, we're going to see here that God is going to bless uh, Isaac through right at this point. Remember my little introduction statement? And so he lied and yet God at that point is going to bless him. Mm-hmm. And you go, oh. what do you think? Is it okay to lie to save a life if you think your life is in danger? Are you a Christian? <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, yeah, you would do that. <laughs> I'm just bringing up yeah. various lies with the... I remember reading in Corey Ten Boom a story where there, there were people hiding under the table or something like yeah. that, and the yeah, soldiers come in, and where are they? You know, are they under the table? Or, or no, where are they? And they said, she said under the table, and they never looked. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. They had a rug wow. under the table with a trap door, yeah. and oh, so she, she told the truth, mm-hmm. and God Whoa. provided mm-hmm. safety. And then later she told the truth again, and the one was arrested and taken away, but, but he was set free. Mm-hmm. Pretty quiet around. What are you supposed to say? <laughs> I don't think we can judge. I don't think we can judge. What? I think if I choose to lie, I'd say personally, this is my conviction, that I don't believe God is big enough to make it work out the way He wants it to work out. So if if she cho- if I heard correctly. Uh, uh, if if she, if she were to choose to lie, it would reveal that she uh, doesn't think that God is big enough or powerful enough to deliver or something like that. That she needs to lie in order to uh, rather than trust in God uh, to deliver. Is that close to what you said? Mark? No, I, I agree with Joanna, but it'd be really hard if... Yeah, if it's your wife yeah. or your, your child. Uh, yeah. See, I, I don't think it would, would necessarily be easy, but... Um, uh, and I don't know... Uh, how, there are people that fall on both ends of this in an ethics class. And so to say that there is an absolute, my answer is correct because I'm the teacher. You know, it's, uh, it's not that easy of an answer. And I might give an answer here in class, but if there is a gun to my head and my children were at stake, um, you know, what I would do, I don't know. Um. Okay, I just bring it up because we... Tiny sin compared to the terrible sin of somebody putting a gun to your head. It just fails in comparison. Um, I I kind of disagree with the idea that it's okay for me to sin in order to either prevent someone else or whatever. I am responsible before God. Um, we're going to see with Joseph... Um, you know, later tonight, how uh, I don't think, or it's not Joseph, but anyway, with the manipulation that, that's going to be going on between Jacob and Esau and in that family. Uh, God uh, uh, said, well, anyway, we'll get to that. I don't want to, so uh, let's see, where did we question? Um, now, so what, what happened? 
Uh, Isaac goes down. Uh, he lies about his relationship with Rebecca um, because he fears for his life. And so at this point, God blesses Isaac and causes everything that he has to prosper. Chapter 26, verses 12 to 14. Okay, so God greatly blessed him. He became very wealthy while he was here. And God also confirms the covenant to pass through Isaac, verse 24. Chapter 26, verse 24. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Okay, so the, the covenant is reconfirmed to be passing now through Isaac. Uh, Esau, in chap the last part of the chapter, is going to get married as well. Um, however, uh, his marriage is not going to be pleasing to his mother and father, verses 34 and 35. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Eri, Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elam, Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to they, they brought grief of mind uh, to his parents. Now, a little chuckology, meaning I don't have a strong basis for this, but uh, I believe that later God is going to take uh, the people, um, the descendants of Abraham, and move them to Egypt in order to protect the line of uh, Abraham. And we see that a little bit here where that line is being intermixed um, and we'll see that happening uh, in the next section as well. Okay, let's try our survey. Okay, stand up. We'll see if we can get all the way to Esau and Jacob. We don't want you to get too stiff uh, sitting down. Uh, ready? Creation. Creation. Oh. Salt, Terra, so Tyrus, Euphrates, Heron, River, Dead Sea, Dead Sea, Dead Sea, And the next one is the coat, Joseph. Okay, very good. Yes. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, when you said, like, uh, well, obviously Jacob lied. Uh, for the sake of the covenant that God made with Abraham, he was willing to seem to tolerate a certain amount of disobedience maybe just for the sake of the covenant does that sound reasonable i don't know if it's for the sake of the covenant but i see god's grace uh throughout the old testament you know we tend to think of these men abraham you know uh never sinned a, a perfect person isaac and and especially when we get to jacob uh, we're, we're gonna see a, a fallen I might even use the word dysfunctional family <laughs> and as using a common term for today. And yet in the midst of that, God's grace 
uh, is going to be shown, and um, God's going to bless, and God, that covenant is going, God is going to fulfill his promise as he promised. I myself make this promise, he said. Yeah. But there was no morality at that time. I mean, this was before the Ten Commandments, and it's funny to me that this one guy, guy was, uh, what, he could have killed uh, uh, Isaac, but but he, the fact that he might have slept with his wife was a great, greater crime than killing somebody, apparently. You know, where did that come from? Um, you know, in Genesis 9, we see uh, murder, um, and the punishment for murder is if someone murders, that their life is to be taken. Um, but the other commands we don't fully see until, yeah. um, you know, for me, as a dispensationalist, I see various what we call economies, uh, dispensations, so various sets of rules that God puts in place at various times of history. And so uh, with Adam and Eve, they didn't have the same rules that King David had. Um, and I explain that through that progression of revelation and through God's various different economies, the way he set up how people are to live. Um, and so those laws are in the process of, of coming. And I think the reason for Genesis being written, if you remember, was so that man, that the Israelites who were in the desert at this time, would see that God is their creator and therefore he has the right to make the, the rules. Yeah. And so when he gets to Exodus and Leviticus, these rules are going to be laid out. And so man, you need to obey. Why? Because of Genesis. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, Jacob, uh, the third section. Uh, the, it shows a family that's going to be manipulating one another, is going to be deceiving one another, rather than living a life of faith and trusting God to fulfill his promises. They are going to uh, take the situation in their own hands and, um, and uh, lie and manipulate um, so let's read Genesis 25. Oh, and they're going to do this in spite of the promise that God made. Rather than trusting the promise that God made, they're going to try to manipulate in order to accomplish that promise. Let's look at the promise first. Genesis 25 and verse 23. There Two kids in there, and what did God promise? And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, two people shall be separated from your body, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Who's going to be the servant, and who's going to be the master? Who's going to be the head? The younger. And who is speaking here? The Lord. The Lord. So we know that this is going to take place. Now, uh, who did, who is God speaking to in these verses? Rebecca. Rebecca. But again, the scripture does not say, but uh, I would guess that it wasn't a secret that Isaac knew this promise as well, uh, that the older uh, would be the servant of the younger. Um, so anyway, that promise was given, that prediction by God, and um, even though Esau had sold his birthright to Jacob, uh, Esau continues, did I say that right? Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, mm -hmm. but Isaac continues to favor the older son. I think I said it right the second time. No. And so... Uh, Jacob and Rebecca are going to lie in order to obtain the promise, Rebecca, uh, the, the blessing from the father. What takes place is Rebecca hears Isaac 
telling the oldest son, I want you to go out and to find, to, to shoot some kind of a wild animal, bring it to me and feed it to me, and then I will give you the blessing, meaning that you as the oldest son are going to receive this special blessing, not the younger son. Rebecca overhears this, and so she decides to uh, instruct her son Jacob to put on some uh, it was a goat skin or some kind of hairy um, skin and to put on the clothes of Esau and uh, pre go to your father, take this food and tell him that you are Esau and uh, let him bless you instead of the oldest son. So he just uh, is going to trick them. 27 verses 15 and 16. Chapter 27 verse 15 and 16. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her elder son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins on the young goats, of the young goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his hands. And thus Jacob is, receives the blessing of his father, verses 27 to 29. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Curse be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. So who is supposed to bow down to who? Who's to be the master and who's to be the servant? <coughs> Oops. Where did I end up there? I lost my place. Okay. I think it's there. Uh, so, um, we see the manipulation. <coughs> the question that I have for discussion is, is it, was it necessary for Rebecca and Jacob to lie, to deceive, in order to fulfill the promise that was made um, no. Well, it would have been interesting to see what the Lord would have done. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but Isaac thought he was blessing Esau. So, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of confusing, too, because he's in his mind, he's giving the blessing to Esau. Yeah. And, uh, so is he and being disobedient? Well, we don't know directly. I mean, the promise was given to Rebekah. And so we're not told in Scripture that Isaac was aware of that promise. Um, I guess that he was aware of it. They had favorite sons and... Um, which is not good for a father in my estimation. Yeah. And uh, we're going to see that jealousy being passed on to Jacob's kids. And, mm. and so it's like there is a family that has jealousy and favorites and these types of things. Uh, so, so I see it as a disobedience, but it's not directly stated in scripture. Um, no. But what is stated is that uh, when Jacob walks into the room, Isaac asks him, are you Esau, my oldest son? And Jacob says, yes. Uh -huh. So we know that that deception, that lying, that manipulation took place, which I believe is, is not right. I think God is able to provide and to accomplish his purposes 
without our uh, disobeying of the commands of God. He doesn't have to have my help. Yeah. Where did the birthright come from anyway? What was so important about it? Uh, the birthright gave the oldest son later is going to receive a greater inheritance. Um, yeah. But it wasn't an issue with Jacob. Not, his oldest son is Reuben, and Reuben got no special favors. Uh, he also didn't deserve a, a special favor. <laughs> but uh, Joseph... Um, was the oldest son of Rachel. Of Rachel. Yeah. And so that double blessing, uh, in a sense, went to the oldest son, but not of Leah, uh, mm. not the oldest son of mm. Jacob. But the promise came to Judah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ag again, uh, God's grace. Um, Okay, uh, let's go on. The blessing, Jacob, as a result of what took place, Esau comes back and finds that not only did uh, he, he lose the, um, what was it that he bought uh, with a bowl of soup, uh, the birthright. Not only did he lose the birthright, but he lost the blessing as well. And so he is angry at his younger brother, and it... Uh, it's heard that he's going to kill his younger brother when his father dies. And so uh, Rebecca, again, uh, decides that she needs to deceive Isaac uh, and lies to him in order to manipulate the sending away of uh, Jacob uh, for his safety. So she, uh, let's see, chapter 27 and I'm going to jump around a little bit. Verse 42, 43, and verse 46. Lynn, is that you? 42, 43, and 46 of chapter 27. And these words oh. of Esau. Go that, right? That's fine. <laughs> Her elder son were told to Rebecca, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, proposed purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these, which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Okay, so Isaac is going to send Jacob away. Um, Rebecca is going to pay a high price for this manipulation. This is the last time that she'll see her son. Um, and so um, Jacob goes uh, north to Haran, goes back. Um, and on the way at Bethel, uh, he gets a rock. I don't know if I'd put my head on a rock. I guess if that's all I had. Uh, <laughs> He gets a rock and he falls asleep and he has a dream. And in that dream, basically the covenant is going to be uh, promised to pass through Jacob. The dream is he sees a ladder. And on that ladder, he sees uh, angels ascending and descending. And then God speaks to him uh, from heaven it's like this ladder is the connection between man and God. It's the connection between heaven and earth. Uh, and we see that ladder, these angels going back and forth. Let's read chapter 28, verses 10 to 13. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. 
and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, the covenant is going to pass through um, through Jacob. Now, I want you to look at John chapter 1. We see a parallel in what Christ is going to say in John 1 and verse 51. John 1 and verse 51. Uh, he's calling his disciples. Uh, Nathaniel is there interacting. Verse 51. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the side. You see the parallel, the angels of God, the heavens are going to be open, the angels are going to be ascending and descending, but it's not going to be on a ladder. What are they ascending and descending on? What's that thing that's going to connect heaven mm -hmm. and the earth between man and connect to God? It's not a ladder. It's not a stair. No. What's the? They're ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is going to be that ladder, that connection, connecting man and God. Um, it's a, a parallel back to what Jacob dreamed with this ladder connecting heaven and earth, with angels ascending and descending, uh, but. In Genesis, they're ascending and descending on a ladder. And John, Jesus says, these angels are going to ascend and descend on me. I'm going to be that connection. So we see John 1. Uh, so God promises Jacob that the land uh, would be his and his descendants. Uh, and he would have many descendants. God also promised to protect Jacob. Uh, while he was out in the land, and thus this confirmation, the covenant is now going to pass through Jacob. And so Jacob uh, goes from this meeting, and he makes a vow to God. And he's basically, well, let's read the vow. Uh, chapter 28, verse 20 and 21. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, will keep me in his ways, that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Okay, so he's saying that Yahweh, the Lord, uh, will be my God. I will serve him uh, if he fulfills uh, this promise to bring me back safely. Now, question. Um, is it okay to make a vow today? He said... Uh, Jacob made a vow. First, what is a vow? It's a promise. What's the difference between a vow and a promise? We make a vow when we get married. Mm -hmm. More serious, it's more consequences serious. for not following through on it. Okay, more serious. Good. So is it okay to make a vow today? Jesus said no. Do not swear by uh, what, what is that your S be a yes and no be a no. Mm. What do you think? got people into trouble, I tell you, making these vows. Like, what's his name? Who, uh, for, I'll kill the first thing that comes out of my tent or something. Uh, what's his, that judge? Jephthah. Uh, was that his? Stupid. Yeah. Stupid. Yeah. Uh, but Jephthah was uh, also uh, mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. Oh. It's a man of yeah. faith. So man that of faith? Chapter 11 is the what we call the Hall of Faith, yeah. all the great men yeah. of faith, and Jephthah is one of those. He was. And so you uh, need to evaluate what took place. Uh, I think that's in Judges, uh, where, uh, anyway. 
So where, where did we, what were we doing? A vow. Turn to Ecclesiastes 5, 4 and 5. Ecclesiastes. Proverbs. Chapter 5, after Proverbs 4 and 5. <coughs> Yeah. That's it. Who's next? It's me, but I'm not there. Who's next? what? Chapter 5, and then verse 4 and 5, Daniel. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Okay. So uh, it's, it's talking of the, the seriousness of um, it's better that you not make this kind of a promise, that you not vow to God if you're not going to fulfill it. It's better not to do it than it is to make the vow and break it. Uh, it's a very serious thing. Usually, as you guys mentioned already, that in our wedding ceremony, that we are making a vow before God and before his people and we are saying, until death do us part. Um, and and uh, various people will talk about making vows and, and this type of thing. Uh, I think it's a possible thing to do today, but I would uh, be very cautious about what you vow, uh, that it be something that is very serious. Um, I know that when uh, I asked Mary, uh, Maggie to marry me, she um, she was silent. Um, I, I, I popped the question and she just sat there. And it seemed like several days and hours and months fleeting in front of my face. Uh, and so I said, uh, well, you don't have to answer me tonight if you don't want to. And she, she said, uh, no, 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 I'll answer. And, so later I found out what she was, was thinking, and one of the things that was, she was evaluating is that this is a vow that she is making before God, and that she didn't know who this Chuck fella for sure. She thought that I was the right one and that my character was right, but she was saying to herself that if he is unfaithful, I will remain faithful to you. I will not get remarried. I will uh, remain faithful to this vow that I'm making. So she was going, now you know why it was taking so long. That was only one of the things that she was working through in her head, uh, taking seriously this idea of a vow. Okay. Uh, the meeting of Rachel and the deception of Laban. The tricker is going to receive some of his own medicine. Uh, these verses are going to show how God is going to keep his promise to bless Jacob and to eventually bring him back. But it's also going to show us the discipline that God is going to do uh, with Jacob, um, giving him some of his own medicine, so to speak. So, uh, Jacob uh, meets Rachel. It's a very parallel situation to Isaac. So, Jacob is at a well, and uh, he, is, uh, provide, he rolls the rock back so that uh, Rachel can feed the flock. And he gives a kind of an interesting greeting, uh, which we'll see in verse 11. But I want to read chapter 29. Verses 9 through 12. Is it Paul? Oh, me? Oh, sorry. 9 through 11. Or 9 29, through 11. 9 to 11. 9 to 12. Now, while he was still talking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Then Jacob kissed Rachel there and began go. to weep aloud. <laughs> he had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah. 
So she ran and told her father. Okay, so we see this unusual greeting. You know, I, I learned from this scripture, if you want to find a mate, you go to a well and wait at the well. And okay. It seemed to work for Isaac and it worked for, for uh, Jacob here as well. But anyway, this greeting was uh, not a unusual greeting of a relative. Look at verse 13. Paul, do you want to read that also? As soon as Laban heard she, the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all these things. So we see that same kind of greeting, and you can see it even today. I don't know if you've seen on TV when two Arabs will meet one another and, and different officials even, that they will uh, kiss one another, hug embrace and, and kiss one another a part of their culture a kiss on the cheek like this yeah. one two three i think i needed uh, that uh, maggie and i had a uh, rule that uh, when we were alone that we wouldn't touch and i would have liked to have this other rule i think but, I, uh, <laughs> but anyway i was a pastor at the time and i had my own house and she was a cef worker and uh, we felt we wanted to have a, a strong wall, but this looks better to me. You know, look, kiss here. Even the cheek would have been okay, you know. So Not kiss bad. Him before you were married? Uh, until after we were engaged, then oh. we had our first kiss. Um, so, chapter 29. Uh, basically, uh, Jacob wants the hand of Rachel, and so uh, he makes a deal with the father, that Laban, that he will work for seven years in order to have uh, the payment uh, for his bride. Uh, chapter 29, verse 20. You think maybe he was in love? Seven years went by, it seemed like only a few days. Um, however, the wedding comes. Uh, I don't quite all understand this as well, but uh, basically Laban, the father, switches daughters on the wedding night. Chapter 29, verse 23 and verse 25. Hmm. So the tricker is tricked. Laban is basically saying that it was, their, was not their custom for the younger daughter to marry first. And so the agreement is basically that the wedding week, I go, wow, a week, whole week, uh, that uh, after a week that he could marry Rachel as well, and that uh, Jacob would work another seven years uh, for, for Rachel. So uh, he ends up with two wives, uh, and yet there's going to be uh, great jealousy uh, between these two wives. Um, but God is going to also bless Jacob in the midst of all of this, and he will become very wealthy uh, through it. So we see jo uh, God blesses Jacob uh, with children and with possessions. Uh, the children by Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Dinah. And uh, children by Bilhah, uh, Rachel's handmaid was Dan, Naphtali. Children by Zilpha, Leah's handmaid were Gad, Asher, and then Rachel's children were Joseph and Benjamin. So God blesses with uh, 13 uh, children. Uh, it's also mentioned, though, that there's great rivalry uh, between these two wives. Chapter 29, verse uh, 31, and chapter 30, verse 1. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. So we see that envy, that rivalry is one wife 
uh, is having children and uh, again the manipulation uh, that that goes on um, the dysfunction again of, uh, of what a family should be so uh, 14 years have gone by uh, Jacob um, is feels that he needs to start providing for his own family so he makes a deal with Laban that any of the spotted animals are going to be Jacob's and then any of the animals that are not spotted or speckled will belong to Laban so Jacob is going to work and any of those spotted animals will be his and uh, Laban again trying to trick uh, it agrees to what's taking place, but then he takes all of the spotted animals and separates them, gives them to his sons. Um, but uh, God blesses Jacob anyway, and so he prospers. Chapter 30, verse 43. Okay, so Jacob became very rich. God blessed him with uh, children and with possessions. And thus, in chapter 31, uh, Jacob is going to return to Cana, um, both because of jealousy that's taking place because of how rich Jacob is, has become, but also God is going to direct Jacob to return. Chapter 31, verses 1 to 3. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's, and from what was our father's he has acquired all his wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favorable <coughs> to him as before. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. So Jacob uh, leaves, he flees from Laban, verses 19 to 21. When Laban had gone to shear his flock, then Rachel stole the household idols that were her father's. And Jacob deceived Laban, our Aramean, by not telling him that he was fleeing. So he fled with all that he had, and he arose and crossed the Euphrates River and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. When Laban finds out, three days later, he takes off uh, after Jacob. He catches him seven days later. But the night before, God intervenes by appearing to Laban in a dream and warning Laban not to harm Jacob. Verses 23 and 24. And he took his brethren with him and pursued after him seven days' journey, and they overtook him in the Mount Gilead. And God came to Laban, the Syrian, in a dream by night, and said unto him, Take heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. So Jacob goes on his journey as he starts getting close. He sends a message uh, to Esau, his brother. And Esau gathers together 400 men and starts coming towards Jacob. Now, if you remember, when they left, it wasn't on the best of terms. And thus, Jacob becomes uh, a bit nervous. Um, so let's look at chapter 32 and verse 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and there are 400 men with him. In Cebuano, we say, Halaka. It means uh, be aware, beware, watch out, something like that. So, Halaka. Uh, is, uh, Jacob is uh, very afraid. Look at verse 7. He was greatly afraid and distressed um, because he has probably reason uh, as he stole the blessing uh, and from Esau. So Jacob is fearful, so he prays for safety, verses 9 to 11. How many years had it been since he left? 20? Uh, I don't know for sure. Years to marry Rachel and then all those years to build up this yeah. 
Oh, 9, chapter 32, verses 9 to 11. Who's next? Paul. Oh. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. So he decides that what he's going to do is he's going to divide the camp, and he takes several gifts uh, of animals, and it's quite a huge number of gifts, and he sends them ahead to Esau to try and appease him. Uh, and look at chapter 32, it's verses uh, 13 through 16, and then jump to verse 20, Mel. 13 through 16. So it's quite a gift, you know, it's not just uh, uh, and then verse 22, please. Tw verse 20 also. Okay, now the night before the men meet, Jacob has an unusual count encounter, and it's we'll see it in verse 24, chapter 32, 24. So who did he wrestle with? Uh, what does the verse say? A man. Uh, now look also then if you'd read verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place, you know, for I have seen God face to face and my wife. So who did he wrestle with actually? Okay, but I want to look at a phrase. Uh, I'm going to take uh, a skeptic side and I want to show you that scripture can't be trusted. It's full of contradictions. So I want to show you the contradiction and then you guys... Uh, help me understand. Okay, look at verse 30. He said, I have seen who? God. God. Face face. And he's seen God face to face. Um, and yet, look at John chapter 1 and verse 18. John chapter 1. And verse 18. And I only need the first part of the verse. No man, how many? Maybe just Jacob? But no man has seen God. Now go back to our verse. And what did Jacob say? I have seen God. Not only has he seen God, and the, John said no man has seen God, but Jacob said I have seen God and I saw him face to face. Right here. So, contradiction. Can't trust the scriptures. Christ. Okay. He saw the. It, I would agree. It was likely the the pre-incarnate Christ that was there, but the pre-incarnate Christ is God. But it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Son of God. Son of God. And he was eventually. Well, yeah, eventually. 
uh, but not here yet. This is the only time something like this happens. No. So, huh? Turn to Exodus chapter 33. Not the only time. Okay. Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. says, the Lord used to speak to Moses, and it uses that same phrase, face to face, just as a man speaks to a friend. So that same phrase, face to face. However, because we're running out of time here, uh, I want you to look in the same context of Exodus 33, verse 11, where it says the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. Go to verse 20. Chapter 33, Exodus 33, verse 20. What did God also tell Moses? You cannot see my face for man shall not see me and Okay, so in the same context, God is saying, you cannot see my face for no man. It parallels the John passage that we looked at. But this is in the very same context, just a few verses later, so I assume <coughs> that when Moses wrote these that it was not a contradiction. He was aware. So I think we need to look at verse 11. How do we interpret verse 11? And then also it would be how we interpret, I think, verse uh, Genesis. Well, this literally probably doesn't mean face-to-face. -face. It should be translated differently. Okay. Is it just that God was revealing yeah. What? It was it was not the full glory of God, the fullness of God, that uh, when it was face to face, it was a personal interaction, but it was not the fullness <coughs> of God that was present. Um, and Kathy, in a sense, that's kind of what you were saying. It was an likely an, an angel. Uh, it was God, though. It doesn't say that, you know, it, I saw God, but I think that it was not God in all of his glory, the fullness uh, of his glory. But because uh, you know, this face-to-face, -face, I think, is a, a figure of speech just saying that was God was there with me, and we, we he was right there, uh, but not that he saw God in all of his glory. Questions? Anybody? Paul? I just wanted to say that uh, that, 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 that remark that the, when Jacob wrestled with God and God put his or the, whatever and his socket, uh, the socket of his joint was put out of whack um, and the Jews, the Jews it says the Jews did not eat the well, it's his tendon, but actually it's the meat as associated with that part of the hmm. uh, yeah, cattle uh, cup. And this is true today. Yeah, I had some Jewish friends tell me that very same thing. They still don't still eat that meat. Eat that uh, area that was sacred. They still don't. It's touched by God. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Uh, so Jacob uh, returns. Uh, he meets Esau. It's, everything's okay. Uh, when they do meet, they, they go to different areas. Uh, but there's also not only just danger potential from Esau, there's also, and we'll see in chapter 34, the people of the land. What happens in verse 34 is Dinah, who is Jacob's daughter through Leah, uh, went out to visit the Canaanite women, and she was raped uh, no less than with the, by the king's son, who then wants to marry Dinah. Chapter 34, verses 1 and 2. And, and Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So he goes to Jacob and asks for uh, what price, what do we need to do? He wants his son to be able to marry Jacob's daughter, Dinah. Um, and the two brothers uh, are going to deceive uh, 
and I don't know if you ever heard that before, but Simeon and Levi uh, ask that all the men of the city must be circumcised, that that is going to be the payment, but actually it's a deception that they're going to murder these people. So Genesis 34, verses 13 and 14. The sons of Jacob answered to Shechem and Hamar, his father, deceitfully, and said, Because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were your reproach unto us. So the men are circumcised. Three days later, Simeon and Levi attack the city while people, or the men, are still sore from being circumcised and thus retaliate um, the violation of their sister. Verse 25, Kathy. Now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. <laughs> killed all the males. So as a result of this, um, basically Simeon and Levi are going to be bypassed in the blessing that Jacob is going to give at the end of his life. You can see it in chapter 49, oh. verses 5 to 7. We won't look at it in things right now. But um, Now, in the midst of this, again, you would think God's blessing and God's promise uh, would come at a time of great obedience, and yet it is at this point where the covenant is again... Uh, given to Jacob um, and so Jacob in chapter 35 is told in verses 2 and 4 to to clean up to get rid of the foreign gods uh, purify yourselves <coughs> um, get rid of the rings that are in your ears and uh, and so they go back and they get up I believe it's to Bethel uh, that same place Let's look at verses 11 through 13, chapter 35, verse 11. God also said to him, I am thy Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I will give it to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. And God went up from him in the place where he was spoken to him. Okay, so the covenant is repeated. As you go through uh, these different chapters, the descendants of Esau are mentioned in chapter 36. Um, I want to try to finish here. So rather than going through the survey again, we've got Esau and Jacob. Uh, I want to transition now to the last, which is Joseph. Chapters 37 to 50. Uh, Joseph, the uh, younger brother, uh, gives a bad report to the father about the older brothers, and also Jacob or Joseph is favored by Jacob, and so he's given a multicolored coat. Uh, not only uh, is that a gift that none of the others got, but it signified that he. Uh, would get a larger inheritance, that he was the favored son of his father. And in a sense, he was the oldest son uh, through what should what uh, Jacob wanted as his first wife. Anyway, let's read chapter 37, verses 2 to 4. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. Hmm. and could not speak peaceably unto him. Have you heard this word, jealousy, before in this family? As this is passing on. Um, if that wasn't bad enough, God gave Joseph uh, a couple of dreams, basically saying that his brothers are going to bow down to him. Verses 10 and 11. Chapter 37, verse 10 and 11. 
But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down, to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in his mind. And you know the story. So uh, eventually they're going to take Joseph and they're going to throw him in a pit uh, and sell him to Egypt. Uh, you know what happens and things down there as well. So uh, let me give you a, a resource, and I'll show you quickly. Um, this site has free visuals for much of the book of Genesis, uh, and it may have more than that even, I would guess. But uh, I'll just show you the, the life. This is of Joseph, and so his brothers uh, take... Uh, the flock and they're out and his father sends Joseph to Shechem and so you can see he gets to Shechem and the people there uh, saw the brothers but they have now gone up to Dotham and so they send him up to Dotham as he's on his way the brothers see him they decide to kill him but eventually they just throw him in a pit in a well and then eventually they uh, sell him to some Ishmaelites who take him down to Egypt um, and so they lie they deceive their father uh, and the father thinks that Joseph is dead so it's very good visuals for your kids for grandkids to tell stories uh, they're good price called free uh, anyway I'm not going to go through Joseph uh, you know Joseph but also your assignment uh, not for next week but a couple weeks from now is on the life of Joseph one of the things to me about Joseph's life that I'm amazed at is how he saw this uh, tragedy his brothers his own brothers sell him as a slave uh, likely he would have died as a slave um, and yet he's able to see God's hand uh, in the midst of that. God meant it for good, uh, Jake, uh, Joseph is going to.